as mother of Jesus. She's the only woman mentioned by name in the Quran. خداوند تو را برگزید و پاک گردانید و از میان همه زنان تو را برای امر بزرگ خیش اختیار نمود She is seen as, a, as the, the ultimate model of perfect balance As in the Bible, an angel tells Mary she is pregnant despite being a virgin. And the angel says, well, God does what he wants. He just says, be and it is. And the angel blew on to Mary. And she conceived. Maryam, man, Jebrail, ferestaldeye parvardegare toam, ta pesari paakize beto atakonam. After she conceives, the Quran's version differs from that in the Bible. There is no Joseph in the story, in, in the Quranic story. She's alone, completely alone, with this burden, literally a physical burden. Man Isa خداوند به من کتاب آموخته و مرا نبوت داده است. In the Quran, this is the first miracle of Jesus. The Bible's first miracle is Jesus turning water into wine at the age of 30. Jesus is born without a father and he's born speaking. So basically it's saying, I can do whatever I want. The ability to talk as a newborn child is one of many miracles not recorded in the biblical account of Christ's life. We have more sayings in the Islamic tradition about Jesus than you'll find in the Gospels themselves. So there is a possibility that other things did happen. There were many Gospels around uh, that didn't all make it into the New Testament. And the church tried to limit the number of Gospels and lives of Jesus. And in the Quran, one's constantly, you know, we're told, uh, O oh people, we have formed you into tribes and nations so that you may know one another. Not so that you may exploit or conquer or colonize or convert or kill, but so that you may know one another, get to know one another. And that means getting rid of all those prejudices and getting to know one another. And this is a spiritual process because as we knock down those uh, prejudices that we have, we're getting rid of those barricades that we protect our shrinking, frightened ego. Kind of thing. I found that in my studies, um, I had to practice what I found called in a footnote, uh, the science of compassion. It, there was a phrase coined by a great Islamist, Louis Massignon. Uh, science, not in the sense of physics or chemistry, but in the sense of knowledge, scientia, the Latin word for knowledge, and Latin, uh, the knowledge acquired by compassion feeling with the other, putting yourself in the position of the other. And this footnote said that a religious historian, like myself, must not approach the spiritualities of the past from the vantage point of uh, post-enlightenment rationalism. You mustn't look on this in a superior way and look at the author of The Cloud of Unknowing, a 14th century text, as poor soul, you know. And You had to uh, recreate in a scholarly fashion all the circumstances which had resulted in this spirituality or this teaching and not leave it or certainly not write about it until you can imagine yourself putting yourself in that position yourself, imagine yourself feeling the same so when I wrote about Muhammad for example 
I had to put myself in the position of a man living in the hell of 7th century Arabia who sincerely believed he had been touched by God. And unless I did that, I would miss Muhammad. I had to put clever Karan, edgy Oxford educated Karan, on the back burner and go out of myself and enter into the mind of the other. And I found, much to my astonishment, it started changing me. I couldn't any longer be quite as vicious as I was or dismissive as I was in the kind of clever conversation. If we could uh, stop all our theological chatter and disputes, we too might be as effective as heaven. Because when we speak about what we call God, nobody has the last word. Allahu Akbar, the Muslims say. God is always greater than anything that we can conceive. It's the world's fastest growing religion, Islam. The Chicago area alone, home to an estimated 400,000 Muslim faithful. Tonight, why some people are making the switch to a religion many Americans have trouble understanding, Mark Saxenmeyer has our special report. This is the story of three Chicagoans, all raised as Christians, all who decided to ultimately reject that religion. Internet is down. Nadira Rodriguez Mohammed grew up Catholic, but found herself constantly questioning the long-held beliefs of her family. I always felt that something was missing for me. Ian Bushner is a law student at the University of Chicago. I felt like that, uh, there wasn't a God. Whitney Nichols is a new Loyola grad who grew up in suburban Streamwood. I guess what I was really looking for was what felt most natural and most logical to me. <laughs> when Nadira entered high school in the mid-1990s, she became friends with a group of Muslim girls. They just had a, this level of contentment and a sisterhood that was... Yeah, I wanted to be a part of that. Ian drifted towards the Muslim students at his high school as well. I remember um, defending some of my um, friends at school from accusations, you know, after 9-11. And then I started reading the Quran. I said, oh, here is a form of God that I've never been presented before. After September 11, you know, the uh, interest actually increased. Dr. Asad Basul is professor at Chicago's Islamic American College. He says the tragedy six years ago initially prompted angry questions, but eventually many of the curious found answers to their own spiritual questions through Islam and converted. Sometimes, you know, negative things bring positive things. You know. In fact, according to a first ever random sampling of American Muslims by the Pew Research Center, 21% of the nation's 2.4 million Muslims are converts to the faith. Eventually, I realized that I was looking to the Quran for advice, for direction. And uh, at the point that you believe that the Quran is revelation from God, then you're a Muslim. The conversion has meant many changes in their lives. Ian prays five times a day. You'll finish a prayer and realize, I've just screwed something up. I've done something mean to somebody. Let me go back and correct that. Nadira wears the scarf, or hijab, as it's called. It is part of my character, you know, modesty. I'm, it's just part of who I am. I don't know if I'll ever be ready to wear the hijab. I've become more modest. I won't wear tank tops and I won't wear shorts. Whitney says she has had to constantly defend her new religion. My father asked me right after I converted, you know, why why do you want to be associated with these terrorists? And I'm like, this is what you see? Oh no! And we kind of have to deal with the, the backlash of, of those who have chosen to do something so horrible. But all say there is no going back. At some age, everyone must decide what they believe and live their life accordingly. I'm Mexican, you know, I'm a female, and I chose this for myself. If you have a, a personal, you know, 
relationship with God, whatever that may be, however that may be, then you're in a good place. Mark Sanxenmeyer, Fox News, Chicago. Booth decided to become a Muslim in the most public of settings, in front of around 25,000 people during an Islamic conference in London. Her conversion immediately sparked media reaction in the UK, much of it negative. Right-wing commentators accuse her of being mad or trying to make a statement in support of political Islam. Your conversion has sparked quite a lot of media interest, uh, some of it reasonable, some of it quite negative. What have you made of that? You know, I think I'm going to realise how much, it, what, what hatred really is now, because as soon as I uh, read uh, some of the comments that are made, um, there are, two, there are two assumptions. One is that all Muslim women are trying to be saved from this evil uh, life that's been given them through Islam and through their evil Islamic husbands. And the second is that um, wearing a veil is something that, that, that women should never have to do. Well, choosing to cover my hair just for modesty reasons and understanding that m women are happy in Islam, that's seen as a betrayal. So there's a lot of anger coming towards me. It's thought that thousands of people convert to Islam in the UK every year, many of them women. Islamic leaders say many converts come to the religion because their interest has been aroused by negative coverage of Islam. As for Tony Blair and his wife, Booth's sister Cherie, they're staunch Roman Catholics. The former Prime Minister has been accused of stoking a clash of civilizations between Islam and the West by invading Iraq and Afghanistan. So what will he and his wife think of Lauren Booth's conversion? I'm sure they'll say, mashallah, and be delighted because they're, after all, they're people of the book. Indian store robberies don't usually end like this one. How did it start? A man walked in carrying a baseball bat. Surveillance video tells the rest. Instead of cash, the store owner pulled out a rifle, a big one, bringing the robber to his knees. He's starting uh, crying. He's a big man. He's crying. He says, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. I have no food. I have no money. I have no job. My family, my whole family hungry for a whole week. Mohammed Sohail then gave the robber $40 and some bread, making him promise never to rob again. I feel just like a break my heart. So I feel bad for him. He's still crying, begging with me. I said, OK. I try to help everybody. There's more. The robber told Sohail he wanted to be a Muslim, just like him. So Sohail told him to raise his right hand and repeat a Muslim prayer. And with that, the attempted robbery ended in a handshake. Welcome, brothers and sisters. I uh, want to just briefly tell you, I'm sometimes asked, how come you're a Muslim? And I tell them, well, God showed me that I'm a Muslim. For the first 35 years of my life, I was a disbeliever. I knew there is no God, I didn't see any need for God, and I didn't believe in God. But ever since I was small, I was interested in science. And as my knowledge of science grew, 25 years ago, in basically a flash, I came to the conclusion that the universe is so perfectly made and everything so perfectly matches together that there must be God. So in one second I went from certainty there is no God to certainty there must be God and only one God. And a little while ago I heard somebody here who was concerned that Maybe the signs that are discovered in the Quran may be wrong. Uh, we should have a committee to see if the signs are right. God says in the Quran, we demonstrate our miracles to those who attain certainty. So, so my answer is, when you have strong iman and you have knowledge of the scientific facts, when you see it, in the Quran, you don't have to worry, is it right or is it wrong? It will jump out at you, it will hit you. And you will say, Mashallah, this is a sign from God. And you want to make such da because you feel very humble. Because you know, this is the truth. There is no false signs, no wrong signs, because this book is from God and he doesn't make any mistakes. Could you comment on the compassion and the raging debate on the Ground Zero site. Okay, well, it, here we have just basically making 
making place for the other. Uh, can we make place for the other? It's a challenge. Don't let's say it's not at ground zero. It's, several, it's a couple of blocks away. It's been there for a long time already. Uh, it's in a deprived part that's been wrecked by ground zero. It's meant as a, a rebuttal of the terrorism. And it's a Sufi, it's, 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 Faisal Ruf is, is a Sufi, like Ibn Arabi. And the Sufis have uh, such, we all need a big dose of Sufism. So uh, here's what Ibn Arabi says, do not praise your own faith exclusively so that you disbelieve all the rest. If you do this, you will miss much good. Nay, you will miss the whole truth of the matter. God, the omnipresent and omniscient, cannot be confined to any one creed, for he says in the Quran, wheresoever ye turn, there is the face of Allah. Everybody praises what he knows. His God is his own creature, and in praising it, he praises himself, which he would not do if he were just, but his dislike is based on ignorance. And so... So much of our fear of the other is tied up with our ignorance. Um, and this is a struggle, and we'll have to see how it works. I'm, I'm not an American, as you can probably tell. And, um, I, for, for, and, and I've, you know, we haven't heard much about this in the UK. We've been concentrating more on those terrible floods in Pakistan, um, which is something we should also be thinking about. Uh, this is, a, a, I would say, it would, I would be so sad if the answer was ultimately no. Because what, one of the things that has been so great about America, as Diana Eck reminded us, is its ability to uh, say uh, no discrimination in religion. So I don't know, this is not my struggle, it's impertinent for me to say so, but to make place for the other uh, don't, not pushing people outside where resentment and pain can fester, but to try to make peace at the site of tragedy. That would be a fine thing. Assalamu alaikum. I am a Muslim. Uh, we Muslim call Hazrat Isa Islam, and here's a lot of Christian, they call Jesus Christ. I think it's important for me to request you that could you let the audience know here, including Christian and Muslim, what was the religion of Jesus Christ? And what did he taught? Did he taught Islam or was he was Muslim or non-Muslim? Thank you. Thank you. The question was, of course, you heard, what was the religion of Jesus? The religion of Jesus was Islam. The religion of Moses was Islam. The religion of all true prophets of God is Islam. Because with Allah, there is only one religion. He says, Inna dina in the Allah al-Islam. Most certainly the religion acceptable in the sight of Allah is Islam. If you want a religion other than Islam, so Allah will not accept it from, from you. And you will be of the losers. Anything else other than Islam? So I said, now the religion of Moses was Islam. The religion of Jesus was Islam. The religion of speech by Muhammad was Islam. It was nothing but Islam. And the proof of that is, you ask the Jew, start with ask the Jew. In our line relationship, we are very closely related to the religion of Moses, Jesus and Muhammad. Three are related, very close. If Moses was alive with us, and if you asked him, oh Moses, what is your religion? I do not expect him to say Judaism. Because this word Judaism is not in his Torah. He's not in his Talmud, he's not in his Mithra. He's, he's nowhere to be found in Jewish literature. The word Judaism is not to be found. You see, it's a concocted word, concocted word. But if Moses was alive and if you asked him, what is your religion? He would say that my religion is a religion of total submission to God's will. A lengthy definition. But one word for that in the Arabic language is Islam. Islam means a religion of total submission to God's will. If Jesus was alive with us today, or in the second coming, if we have a chance to meet him, and if we ask him, say, oh Jesus, what is your religion? We do not expect him to say Christianity. Because if he says Christianity, we can ask him, what church you belong to, sir? 
Are you a Roman Catholic or an Anglican or a Presbyterian or a Lutheran or a Jehovah's Witness? <laughs> silly, silly you would say. It's a silly thing to ask Jesus. I expect him to say that my religion is a religion of total submission to God's will. Lengthy definition. One word for that in the Arabic language is Islam. This is what he came to teach. But if the people, his followers, they took his religion off the rails, actually Paul, they are all following Paul. They are not following Jesus. If they follow Jesus, they will be Muslims. See, because Jesus was teaching them nothing but Islam. The Father in heaven, worship him. They start worshiping Jesus. See, this is not his teaching. As the Quran tells us, testifies on the day of judgment, Allah will ask him, Oh Jesus, did you tell your people to worship you and your mother besides Allah? They said, Oh my, Allah, oh my Lord, you know I never did any such thing. As long as I was with them, I was over them to see that they never did any such blasphemy. But after you took me up, you know what they did. So, in tu'azzibhum fa'innuhum ibaduka. So if you punish them, they are your servants. But if you forgive them, you are exalted in might, you are wise, in your wisdom, you can do what you please. But the religion of Jesus was Islam and he was a Muslim. In the garden of Gethsemane, you read in the Bible that he went there and he went a little further and fell on his face and prayed to God. He made the sujood and prayed to God, said, Oh my father, if it be possible, let this cup pass away from me. But not as I will, but as thou wilt. One word for that, not as I will, but as thou wilt, is a Muslim. I have submitted my will to the will of Allah. Jesus was a Muslim and his religion was Islam. In the Time magazine, July 15, 1974, there were a series of essays under the heading, Who are history's great leaders? And among the contributors, there is one, James Gavin, described as a retired um, a commander of chief, a commander in chief of the American army. This James Gavin, in his list of the most, the greatest leaders, he says, number one, Muhammad and number two he puts his own Lord and Savior Jesus Christ number two then in America again an American by the name of Michael H. Hart of the Hart Publishing Company described as an astronomer and a mathematician this man he writes a book of 572 pages giving the most influential men in history from the time of Adam up to current times. And in his list of 100 most influential men, he puts the holy prophet of Islam, Muhammad, number one. And, surprisingly, he puts his own Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, number three. Let me challenge you, 75% of the wonderful Quran in my wonderful language of Arabic is from the Bible. It says, let me challenge you, me or the audience, or all, let me challenge you. 75% of the wonderful Quran in my wonderful Arabic is from the Bible. You remember that? And he said, he said, he can show it to you now. I said, no, have your patience. He had 75 minutes. He didn't show one example. One example. <laughs> 75 percent of this book is copied in that, and he could not show us one example. You see, you, you know what is to copy, what is to crib, what is to plagiarize stealing somebody else's literature. Look, the Christians and the Jews have been at it. They have been at it, they have written books. Here, Judaism in the Quran by Abraham Katch, few hundred pages. Then the sources of Islam, the sources of the Quran by Reverend Saint Claire Tinsdale. Books, books. They have written more than 60,000 books against Islam from 1800 to 1950. More than 60,000 books they have been written so far. 
See, they behave like innocent little children, little babes, like cherubims, but not cherubims. They have written more than 60,000. Among them, here, Judaism in the Quran, here, the sources of Islam, sources of the Quran. Reverend Saint Claire Tinsdale, Reverend and Saint, he wrote the book. <laughs> and he is giving verses, verses, verses. That one they are giving verses, verses, verses. But this was originally written in Parsi, Persian, in the Persian language. So, Reverend Sir William Moyer, he translates this into English and he writes a preface. He writes a preface to his translation and he says, It is strange, it is strange, it's odd. It's unusual. It's extraordinary. It is strange that though the Jewish and Christian scriptures are spoken of throughout the Quran with the utmost devotion. The Quran speaks about the Jewish and Christian scriptures, the Torah, the Zabur, the Injil, with utmost devotion. Only one passage only one passage is quoted from them, that's all, only one. Though the Quran is speaking about it, 75% is copied, says Dr. Shorosh, 73 quarter is copied from the Bible. Yet this great man, Sir William Moore, a scholar, he says only one passage is quoted from them, namely, and he quotes, namely, and he quotes, the meek shall inherit the earth. One quotation. Now, look for it. There isn't such a verse in the Quran. The nearest is Walakat Sarrafna Walakat Katakna Fit Daburi Mimbahdi Zikri and Nal Arda Yari Suhay Bhaja Salihun said that we had given to Dawood in the Sabur this message that to my righteous servants, my righteous servants will inherit the earth. That is what the Quran says. But this quotation, the meek shall inherit the earth, you find that in Matthew chapter 5 verse 5, where Jesus says, the meek shall inherit the earth. Now you see that in the Bible that our doctor has given me, there are cross references and it tells you that this quotation is from Psalms chapter 37 verse 11. That quotation is from Psalms, Jesus says, Blessed are the meek, for they shall inherit the earth. But when you look for it, you find it in Psalms chapter 37, verse 11, word for word. But Jesus didn't give the credit to David. He said, look, I got this from the Psalms. Muhammad is made to say that this is written, he's actually quoting, this is written, he's giving due credit in the Sabur. it is there. And you find that this is what the Quran says. Jesus Christ is actually plagiarizing. If he didn't mention it, if he didn't give credit, he is plagiarizing. He is stealing from somebody else's writing, not Muhammad. So, still, still, you see, look, what is to copy? What is to crib? You must show to us, I have the Arabic Bible here, in case he hasn't got it, and got the Arabic Quran here. What he must show here, that in the Arabic Bible, Jesus says, I am a father of one. It's a look in the Quran, Muhammad says, I am a father of one. In the Bible, Jesus says, that he that has seen me has seen the father. And you see, Muhammad also says, for example, that he that has seen me has seen the father. This is what is called copy. This is what is called cribbing. This is what is called plagiarism. So far, in the 75 long minutes, unbearably long minutes, he has not yet given us a single phrase of word passage that Muhammad has copied from his 75 percent in the Bible. The Arabic Bible is here, sir, make it easy for you, and the Arabic Quran is also here, make it easy for you. Thank you, Mr. Dida. question remains, where does he say I am God, or where he says worship me, or where does he say that I and God Almighty are one and the same thing? Is there a single Christian who can give me a verse that me and God Almighty are one and the same thing? Is there a Christian in this vast audience who can give me? John 14. 
Look, what does it say, John 14? What does it say? That I am... Right. John, no. I, the reference is incorrect. No, the reference is not 14.6. The reference is, is, the quotation is right. I and my father are one. The quotation is correct. But it is John chapter 10, verse 30. Okay, how can you explain the fact that so many Christians believe in the Bible as it is these days, although you claim that it contradicts itself and it's so obvious? You see, brainwashing. Brain. We all get brainwashed. See, last time when I came in 77, I was speaking to uh, students and professors in the University of Berkeley, San Francisco. And I said, you are all brainwashed. So one professor stood up and corrected me. He says, no, programmed. I said, I beg your pardon, programmed. We are all getting programmed. You see, we are all programmed from childhood into certain beliefs, certain attitudes. And if nobody comes along with a better understanding knowledge to reprogram you, to deprogram you, you remain there. Because he's like a drowning man. He's found something. You know, you say, look, this book can't help you. It is the spirit within you that has helped you. You have been an alcoholic all your life. And you are looking for a way out. You want somebody to help you. You know, you go home and you see your wife is terrified. You find the children are terrified. They're all getting out of your way. You know what's going on. You know, it's terrible. It's horrible. But what can you do? What can you do? You don't like it. But you are helpless. You are in the clutches of this devil, alcohol. And there comes along a person with a little charisma. And, you know, he says, look, man, think and believe that Christ is there for you. He's done everything for you. He's paid for you. Emotionally, you are in a mood for change. You are like a drowning man, struggling to get out, to save yourself from drowning. And the straw, you know, that you hit upon the straw and you were able to come out. You say, the straw helped me. I says, no, it was a struggle that you have been going on in your heart and mind. The struggle you put up brought you to the shore, not the straw. But now when you are trying to explain that on a logical basis, you say, look, it's, the, it's your struggle that saved you. Your intention, your sincerity that saved you. So, no, he's thinking that now you're trying to push him back into the mire. No, we are only explaining. But now people have gone through this experience and they're terrified. If they let go of this, Christ, Christ died for my sins. He saved me. He says, brother, it is your determination, your will, your faith that saved you. So, no, 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 Christ saved me. As if he's trying to, he's terrified. He says, you want to drown him again, you want to push him back into it. Which is not the case. So you see now, we have to give the people an alternative. They haven't got it. The only book they know is this. And this book they can see, the bulk of the people they can see, man, what mess it has made. It hasn't got answers to the problem. So when he lets go, he lets go or he can, grabs, grabs anything. Hare Krishna movement. You know, the guys with the little pigtail, they go around dancing with the yellow saffron clothes and with the drumming. No, no. It is the mind, you know, you want something, grab something, I say, I get peace here, I get peace there. So you join the Munis, you find peace. You join Hare Krishna movement, you get peace. It's any movement. It, it is what you were yearning for, that you were striving for, and these are just excuses. The straws, the straws, the straws. It's not the straws that are saving you. So our Christian brothers and sisters, they don't know anything about the Quran. They know nothing about the Quran. If their own book lets them down, what about any Eastern book? The Quran, an Eastern book, what can it do for you? They don't know this book. And the trouble is with us. We haven't done anything to educate them. We ourselves, we don't know anything about the Quran. The bulk of us. How do you speak to a Christian? My Arab brothers. You see, look, no knowledge. You are good Muslims at heart. Maybe you are good Muslims. You know the Quran. But how are you going to explain to them what the Quran says? In your heart and mind you understand when you say, Bismillahir Rahmanir Rahim, in the name of Allah, most gracious, most merciful. al Malaika to Ya Maryamu. Vaiskalatil Malaika to Ya Maryamu. Inna Allah has tafaki, 
Beautiful. Translate it. Translate it for your hearer. How are you going to translate it? So, well, you see, uh, the angel came and uh, he t- Look, what, what else can you do? You know, yourself you understood it beautifully, mashallah. You know what it says. But now, you don't know the language, you don't know the right terminology. See, you are just a new person here. You, know, you are maybe a mathematician and electronics and all that. But this language, how to translate what you are reading, you don't know. So, my brother said about you people, he said, look, the Quran are for the non-Muslim, American. He didn't use the word non-Muslim, but that's what he meant. American, you are, most of you might be born here, you are also American. Muslim, born here, you are American. But he said, no, he had in mind non-Muslim American. So, he let them have it. But that's also not good enough. You see, you, I said, you Arab also need it. Hi, um, I just wanted to ask you um, if you can just talk briefly um, about how they say that a man can have four wives. Can you just, um, because it does sound very sexist, so I just was wondering if you can talk about that. (laughs) It's a little bit off the subject. The lady would like to know how can a man have four wives. I think it's a little bit off the subject. You'll answer, okay. Well, the Sheikh will answer you, even though it is a little bit off the topic. (laughs) Now, this is the pet question. You know, when the Arabs, when they go to America or to Britain, the Westerner says, you come from Saudi Arabia? I said, yes. So how many wives have you got? (laughs) (laughs) How many wives have you got? He says, you see, when he goes to America, when the Americans pose this question to him, he says, he says, he says, look, I got only one wife. But this is a solution to your problem. This polygamy is a solution to your problem. You see, sir, you have a problem. You have in your country 7.8 million more women than men. If every man in America got married, there will be still 7.8 million women who will not be able to get husbands. And we know every man will never marry. Man gets cool feet for so many reasons. You know that? I meet a young man. How old are you? He says, 35. Are you married? He says, no. I say, what's wrong with you? What's wrong with you? Do you need a doctor? Shall I take you to the doctor to find out? You know? <laughs> what's wrong with you? Come on. He says, there is a friend of ours. You know, he's got a daughter, good looking, well educated, good family. Come. He says, right. He's right. I take him along, and when he comes to the crunch, he finds some excuse to back out. He knows the reason. He won't tell me. That maybe at the back of his mind, he won't make the great man. You know, he has done so many abuses, he's finished. That guy, so he finds excuse for not doing that. Man, 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 man gets cold feet for so many reasons. But Muhammad, you know, somebody to give them protection. They don't mind a husband. They don't mind a husband. Even if they're frigid, they're cold. They don't mind somebody to give them protection. I'm telling you, this is the psychology of women. But we know every man will not hear. If, even if every man got married, there'll be 7.8 million women without husbands in America. And of the manpower they have there, there are 25 million sodomites. You call them gays. Another 25 million women can't get husbands. Then your prison population, 98% are males. Your prison population, 98% are males. I said, your problem is getting compounded. Islam offers you a solution. You laugh at us. I said, the laugh is on you. The laugh is on you. Islam says, marry women of your choice by twos and threes and fours. But if you cannot do justice between them, marry only one. The only religious book on earth. The only religious book on earth which has the statement, marry only one, is the Quran. There is no other book, religious book on earth, which has such a statement. The Quran says, marry only one, if you can't do that. Last two questions. The lady over here. I've been told that women in Islam wear a veil because in this way men will treat them respectfully. 
Um, but I see the veil as a form of oppression because why should they have to cover themselves um, because of the weakness of men? Shouldn't they be treated with respect regardless? Could you please explain the veil and did Mary have to wear a veil? Madam, Madam, your Bible says, your Holy Bible says, you know, Paul, Paul, Paul is telling you that the woman must cover her head, that the woman who doesn't cover her shave off her hair. Your Bible says that. <laughs> the woman, the woman who bears her hair says, shave them off. Shave it off. That's what the Bible says. And you woman, the, your Bible says she must not be allowed to open her mouth in the church. But that's your churches, they don't believe all that. And your people don't believe in that. So you are inviting trouble. You know, because of this, in America, in New York, no woman is safe after dark. No woman is safe in France. During daytime, women have been raped in the street. And people just walk by, looking the fun. Say, or maybe they're enjoying themselves. Woman is being raped. No, no. I said, you are inviting it. Look, this modesty, the nuns, the nuns, you know, the nuns, Roman Catholic Church. Nobody gives them a second look. If Mary, the mother of Jesus, came along, you won't give her a second look. But my dear sisters, those women on your gold coast, that's a Scarborough and all that with bikinis and tangas and G-strings, look. She... It's attracting, <laughs> look, even an old man like me, I tell you, my God. <laughs> if, if I went there, I tell you, I'll be burning inside. <laughs> I'm telling you, look, this is the nature of man. God made us like that. The thing that allures man more than anything on earthly existence is woman. Do you know that? I don't know. The Quran says, the Quran says, Zuyina lil nasi hubbu shahwati min an nisa. Fear in the sight of men is the love of things they covet. Number one, min an nisa, women. Wal banin, then son. You know, I've got 11 sons. I can make my own football team. You know how, how, the, you know, it makes me feel proud. I've got 11 sons, you know, my own football team, my own cricket team. Wal mm banin. -hmm. And number three, well, anatir al mukantar min al zahabi al fidda, and hoarded heaps of gold and silver, and wealthy land, and horses branded for excellence, and all this. This is the list that is given in the Quran. Number one, women. In the city of Durban, there is a firm called Lucian Motors. They sell second-hand trucks. You know, lorry, lorry, trucks. We call them trucks here too. Trucks. We call them trucks. And on the trucks that they advertise, there's a woman in the bikini on top of the truck. Then G North, they sell farm implements. And on the tractors that they advertise, there's a woman in the bikini on top of the tractor. I'm asking these Westerners, I say, what has a woman in the bikini got to do with a second hand truck or with a tractor? Except the man. You see, the woman is being dangled, so he'll read the advert. And BMW, I don't know if you have BMWs here. It's a motor car, it's a motor car supposed to be a little better than the Mercedes Benz. I'm not in the market for it. You see, I started with the Volkswagen Beetle, I did 120,000 miles, and I had to change for another Beetle, and another Beetle, and another Beetle. Then they stopped making the Beetle, you know the Volkswagen Beetle. They started the Golf, so I had to buy Golf number one, Golf number two. I'm still not in the market for a BMW, but I'm forced to read this advert. In my newspaper, I see a BMW motor car, and with a woman, in the skimpy, skimpiest of bikini, what you call the tanga, you know the g-string. She, she's standing in front of the motor car, and it's, it's written at the bottom, test drive her now. Allah, Muhammad Rasul.
Allah